What are we going to talk about? Well, because this is the uh, New York State Writers Institute event, and many of the people here are aspiring writers, writers in action, I thought maybe we'd talk tonight specifically about adaptation, because I think it's of great interest to people how you did this. So um, let's do that. I think a lot of people think that taking a novel to film is sort of transposing it to a higher key. But I doubt a novelist would agree. <laughs> I think so. so what is it then? Is it a process of relocating your attention, putting your attention elsewhere on your story? Do you have to look elsewhere in the same material for another way to convey the tale? What, what is this process for you and how do you, and what's its value? Well, I think that uh, the basic element of film is dialogue and action. And it is not what the novel is, which is a great deal of interior activity. And especially Ironweed. Ironweed has an awful lot of the interior life of Francis and of Helen, and also of Katrina. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's very difficult to put on screen and start up interior monologues or, or voiceovers. I mean, they're all used. Every, element of the novel gets translated in some way or other in small ways into movies of all kinds but by and large the, it's not it's not done the basic film is is keep the action going and uh, and uh, keep the suspense going and get your story in the first paragraph like good journalism mm. uh, every scene you say that to your and um, and that was what I did. I mean, that, that was what uh, uh, Hector Babenko and I, we, went, we cut the book together and uh, brought it down to the main plot lines. And, and I, you know, it was very, very difficult to cut so much of the, the interior life. Sure. Uh, what was what the book stands on in so many ways. But that's what, that's what it's all about. I mean, in a novel, you can do anything with anybody. But in the, in the movies, you, you just have to adhere to what the form demands. It is motion picture. And that's what you keep, keep it moving. So as you were doing the adaptation and turning this into a, a film with Vivenko, were you looking, were you literally, you personally, not him, just about you, what your, I would like to know about your process. Were you referring to the novel or were you working off of what you knew of the novel in your mind? Were you literally sitting down with the novel and saying this goes in and this doesn't go in? Or were you more in a, a, a creative state of the way you were when you were first creating the book? No, I don't think I was in a creative state. I mean, um, that's not like, it's not the same as creating it. It was, the, it was, it was reorganizing it. Mm -hmm. and. Um, um, and um, finding what you know, what was basically cinematic, and Hector had a lot lot to suggest on this. I mean, uh, we we sat and talked for a couple of weeks, I think, and uh, every day I would go and work on it, and then we'd read it the next day, and and move forward, and um, um, and then he went away, uh, and I went to Europe for something or other, and. Um, um, and then we came back together for about another week, and then we we put the, a final version in, and that's that's uh, the one that flew. And we, he he went to L.A. with it and gave it to Jack Nicholson. And Jack had already read the book, and he read the novel. He read the script very quickly and said yes. Mm -hmm. Good. How do you make these selections, though, as you're looking at your own work and, you're, and you know perfectly well that if you put everything in, that we're going to be in the theater as long as it takes to, to read the book. And you just have to literally take the, it's not the best scenes, because books are cumulative experiences. And this plus this plus this plus this is what the writer wants the reader to understand to add up to the vision of the universe the writer has. So how do you go in looking at your own work and make those kinds of selections for a shorter, more distilled version of the story? Well, you know, it, it's, um, it's painful. <laughs> 
You know, the, yeah. this idea of cutting, uh, even especially when you're cutting from the, even when, when you finally get it on, out of the novel onto the page in the script, you're going to have to cut it again. I mean, we had a, a, a script that was too long. And so it was constantly cutting. The principle of, I, I worked on the Cotton Club with Francis Coppola, and he and I w would do the same thing what Hector and I did, and only with Francis it was cra much crazier, and uh, uh, we wound up writing about 40 scripts for that movie. <laughs> it was an insane project. But it, it would, I, I learned a lot, and I would write in the daytime, and then, I mean, we'd talk and figure out the scenes, and then I would write it, and um, and then give it to him, and he would, I'd say, five pages, and then he'd cut it down to three and a half. Mm. And I would put the three and a half together, and maybe, uh, and give it back to him, and then he'd cut it down to two and a half. Mm. And uh, that's... And, <coughs> The principle I worked on there was like what you wrote yesterday, cut in half today. And <clears throat> the, the producers and the, the, the directors are always going to want you to cut these uh, wonderful scenes. Uh, there's um, your favorite scene, uh, and then you come in and they say, we're going to cut the, we're gonna cut the, um, the gilded cage scene, or we're going to cut the Katrina scene. Do we really need the Katrina scene? That was one of the one of the producers asked me that, and I said, "Are you kidding?" And, and, and I, I put up a, a a serious blockade against that. <laughs> but I remember, uh, you know, when when you do this, uh, you're you, you you're the writer after all, mm. and the writer has no standing in Hollywood. You're. <laughs> You're, you're at the bottom of the world, <laughs> the bottom of the, li the list. I had more say in, in this than a lot of writers ever have in what went into this movie. But at the same time, when it finally came down uh, to the, the final cutting, uh, the, it was up to the producer who was the, the final cut. And Hector, I don't, I'm not sure, Hector may have had final cut. Uh, but Hector did have the, the final moral suasion that changed everything. And he, Jack Nicholson was, was a, a great believer in cutting, in cutting, in cutting. And Hector went to Brazil at one point in, in a, after the film was shot, and they were in Hollywood. And Jack went into the cutting room with the producer and produced a new version of it uh, for Hector's perusal. And Hector came back and <clears throat> had something like an apoplectic fit. <laughs> and uh, he persuaded in a difficult way um, the produce, to the producer that, that he was going to put it all back the way he had it, which he did. Jack was still for cutting and cutting it. He thought it was too long. I never, I never thought it was too long. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> but when I went out, they were ready to cut uh, this scene where it was a baseball game, and uh, Francis is telling the story about a crooked umpire who won't call the game because the, and Francis's team is winning, and, and it's too dark and nobody can see anything, and so there's a funny. Sh I won't, t I won't tell the story here, but it's a great story because it's. It goes to the moment where uh, Francis is responding to Margaret, his daughter's reaction to what he's been, he has just read her a letter that she wrote to him when he was in, in Montreal or in Toron Toronto and playing baseball and, and she wrote him a, a marvelous letter and, uh, and he's very, she's very moved by it after being very angry with him. And, and so he doesn't know what to say, and he tells this story instead of what happened in Toronto. And that was uh, the, um, a, a, a scene that had to be in. And so I, I wound up uh, editing it down from, I think I got two minutes out of it, and, uh, and it saved it, and it's in the movie. Anyway, but that's the way it is. You've got to scream and yell and do whatever you can. And, um, 
that, that, that's expected of the writer to, that he's going to complain about the the cutting. Is it a different kind of screaming, yelling, and thinking of editors as vermin, which is a word <laughs> that you once used having to do with managing editors? All, all managing editors, editors are vermin. All managing editors are vermin. I, in told, fact, I told that to Rex Smith and uh, Jack when, Leary at the yeah, time. Junior. When he was a managing I editor. I told him when I was at the point, that I was, at that point, I was a managing editor. And I, I, I was quoting H.L. Mencken. Anyway. So uh, are, is there a different kind of yelling and screaming in the editing process of film than there is? Yes, it's a different scream. That and different, can you... Yeah, the Raymond Chandler, you know, uh, he knows, he said, he explained when he was writing the screenplays and, and they were cut and the producers were cutting, he said, you're expected to scream even though you know you're not going to get anywhere. He says, it's like cutting your own throat with a banana. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good line. So there's a particular challenge in terms of the the maintenance of the story for what is for lack of a better term for the literary book for the and this is of course a literary book the writing is so damn exquisite that you know some of the sentences positively drug us so is there the expectation with the kind of cast you had that those fine people are going to go read your book and understand that when you have phrases, I, I had some phrases here that you know, are literally untranslatable into film when you say that the new and frigid air of November lay on Francis like a blanket of glass. We're not going to show that, or we're not going to show one of my favorite lines, Francis stood in the junkyard driveway looking for old Roscombe gray clouds that looked like two flying piles of dirty socks blew swiftly past the early morning sun. We're not going to have socks in the movie going by us, <laughs> but is it your expectation that these good people will read this and understand it and, and give us that affect? Well, I think that that's, that's a crapshoot. Every time you, you get a, if you get a great actor, mm -hmm. and we had two and great did. actors, we had three, yeah. Tom Waits was wonderful in this as Rudy. But uh, with, with um, Merrill, Merrill wanted, uh, in the monologue where she's in the church, I think, around that time. It's the beginning of her memoir about her, her whole life where she's right. talking to herself about a death and, and leaving Francis. And, and it's, it's a very moving thing that I, I just exploded with one day. And it just was like, I don't even know where it came from. But it was, it, anyway, and she loved so much of it. And of course, all the actors in the world want to, want to have longer parts, you yeah. know. And um, they, uh, and so, but, but Meryl was not doing that. She just wanted th these particular phrases to go back in that had been in the book, and she read the book very carefully. And then she came and she said she, we sat around for one afternoon and um, went over two or three scenes like that, and and uh, I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll try and keep them short, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to get it in. But then I was there the very first day of the shoot, first shoot, was uh, in the, the, the uh, studio where, out in Central Avenue where they were, they had the set for uh, Jack and Clara's apartment. And um, Meryl was sitting there, and she was just spouting off something about... Frances and, and her own condition, and, and she said everything so clearly and so perfectly, understandably. And she, you know, so I, I said to Benko, I, "You can give her a lot more." I mean, she and she she spat it out so fast, and it was so crystalline. I it was a it was a remarkable moment for me to look at an actress and see just how. What a great actress and a great speaker Merrill was, and that was so. Therefore, I said, oh, you know, I don't mind giving her more lines. It's 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 easy. Right. I mean, you're, you're you're not worrying about the extent of the scene because she's going to hurry them along anyway, and and, and she can go cut something else. <laughs> the uh, the on the ongoing cycle of cutting. So I understand you're turning this now into a play. Yeah. So can we talk about the difference? Can we talk about taking one beautiful idea, writing the hell out of it the first time, writing the hell out of it the second time, and now taking it on again in an entirely different format? 
Well, right, right now I'm in the process of, uh, uh, I've written it twice. I'm uh, writing with a collaborator, uh, a woman, a director, and an actress who has specialized in um, translating um, fictional work into theater. Her name is Jody Markell. And um, Jody and I have been collaborating on this. And um, what we've done is what we could not do in a movie, which was use these, these uh, interior monologues of Francis and Helen and Katrina. Uh, because the, in the theater, you know, there's a, it's from Shakespeare, the, the tradition, and, and the Greeks, the, the long interior monologue, uh, O'Neill and Tennessee Williams, where, where everybody speaks their mind to the audience or to themselves or to an inert object or something. And, uh, and you can get away with it. I mean, it's, uh, it's perfectly legitimate. It's part of the theatrical method. And uh, actually, a friend of mine in, in, uh, in the, um, the Writers Institute is helping me get in a, a line which, which I had to be cut for one too complicated to talk about, but I'm, I want this line to go back. And Langdon Brown, who's a very excellent mind in the theater, has given me uh, a little uh, nudge in certain directions on how to get this line in. It, you just can't get it in uh, by uh, talking to yourself. Or, uh, it's, a, it's, it's just a, uh, it's tough. And, um, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to figure out how to do it. And thanks to Langdon. Thank you, Langdon, wherever you are. <laughs> Thank you. So the collaborative process, let's talk about, a little bit about that as we uh, start to wrap this up, because you still have to do your, we have to do the raffle before this isn't, we forget. This isn't enough time. We need another two hours. I know, I know. And, and, I'm, and I would love that. And I hope everybody else would too. But there's this really good movie coming up on the screen. <laughs> And so we got to kind of defer. Um, but I love the idea that you reached out to Langdon to talk to him about how to get the line in. What was the co original conversation that you had with him? Did you just say, can I pitch you the idea for this play? I'm trying to make the, the conversion to... No, no. I, I mean, I talk to him all the time about mm -hmm. the theater and, and whatever I'm writing. And uh, I was in his class. And uh, I was explaining to the class this problem I had and uh, in trying to translate the play into the play, this, uh, this line, which we had to cut the scene. The scene, the line was in the scene, and it, it, it sort of worked, but the, the scene didn't work. The scene, there was something in, inherently cockeyed about the scene, so we threw the scene out. And uh, this is just the first draft of the play that we're, we're dealing with here. And, uh, and so we're seeing, trying, trying to find out what's going on. And then uh, I, I sort of presented it as a problem to the kids to try and present what, you know, if they had any ideas, let me know, write me a letter or something. <laughs> and, and Langdon did. So, uh, um, but that's how it happened. That's how it got out in the open. <laughs> I see. But I'm just tr trying to tell you that, um, you know, there's, there's certain things that you can do in, 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 with, when, in a novel you can do anything. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's perfectly legitimate uh, as long as you get it with the right language. But uh, with, the, uh, with the play it has its own limitations and so does the, and the movies have uh, far more. But you do have, I was thinking of also uh, what you build into the uh, a, a great actor's face, uh, the faces of uh, uh, of the actors express thousands of words in in a, in a, in a second or two seconds, and uh, that you don't have to write. Yes, that's true. I, you can just hope for the best. I was re thinking of that. I was looking back through. This is my original copy, and this is still when I used to make underlinings in books and. And it kind of, it's kind of charming because I remember reading this book and where I was in my life and how much it meant to me. And the, some of them are in red ink. They meant so much to me. But there's a line here about, at the end, um, about Francis. By now he was sure only that he lived in a world where events decided themselves and that all a man could do was to stay one jump into their mystery. And Jack Nicholson portrayed that. that 
factored into his face, as you just said, that idea. And that's because he was just so damn good, but it's really because you just wrote such a yeah, not every act, Not story. every actor can do it. It's, uh, right. it's um, some actors have one expression, and, you know. And, uh, <laughs> yes, and, and some not even that with Botox <laughs> these days, right? Yeah, it's too bad. So this all began, the, your cycle began with a book that you didn't publish, um, Angels and, uh, The Angels and the Sparrows, right? Right. And then we had Legs and we had Billy Phelan and we had Ironweed and we had the movie and now a play. Are we going to see these people again? Some of these people, somebody from... You mean in a new novel or yeah, something like it, that? Or, or, or walking down the street, but yeah, in a new novel. Well, I, uh, you know, my last novel, I had Fidel Castro. I know. Uh, and I, I'm going to write another book about him, a short book. Um, but Francis, I don't know. I brought Francis back about, I brought him back in uh, The Flaming Corsage. Mm -hmm. I brought him back, he started in Billy Phelan. He started in The Angels and the Sparrows, mm -hmm. which was never published. It turned into something else many years later. It turned it into um, Very Old Bones. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, very um, present in that. And he was also... Um, a, um, you know, in Billy, he was such a, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I, I have a, another novel that's cooking and very slowly. Thank goodness. It's in a slow cooker. Not for the slow part. 24-hour cooker, you know. <laughs> I'll turn it up, would you please? <laughs> okay, last question. If you could choose tonight to go home and adapt any of your books for the film, Somebody said to you, here's a $2 million, here you go. Which one would you do? I've already done it. Uh, I have a script for Billy Phelan ready to go. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Where's our um, raffle bucket? Let's do that. I'd also like to do Roscoe on television. I want to do a series on Roscoe. And I Roscoe. think you should. Thank you.